Hello, I'm Adrian Miller, the Soul Food Scholar who drop the knowledge like hot biscuits. And I want to welcome you to Flavors of Juneteenth. We've got an all-star lineup here for a great panel discussion. And we're going to be talking about a number of things. We're going to be talking yeah, about Juneteenth okay, traditions. We're not hearing that, eh? Uh. I do, but I'll still take it, but... Uh... Hello, I'm Adrian Miller, the Soul Food Scholar who drop the knowledge like hot biscuits. And I want to welcome you to Flavors of Juneteenth. We've got an all-star lineup here for a great panel discussion. And we're going to be talking about a number of things. We're going to be talking yeah, about okay, Juneteenth traditions, kind of us. Current trends in soul food, the future of soul food, what it means to us, how we can amplify uh, black voices, especially in the food space, uh, and then some other things that are on our mind. So what I want to do is slowly uh, introduce all of our panelists today. I want to thank Gregory Johnson for being the wizard behind the scenes. And uh, we've just got a lot of great folks for you to talk to. So first of all, we've got Kevin Bledsoe. And Kevin Bledsoe, if you haven't, you may have seen him on TV. Oh, look at that. That's some great advertising. He's holding up my book. Uh, I'm the author of Black Smoke, African Americans in the United States of Barbie. Thank you. I'm going to have to make you my publicist, brother. Got Appreciate it. you. <laughs> so, Kevin, uh, welcome. We're just glad right. to have you here. Glad We've got Norwood. Yep. Uh, Norwood Clark, who's Uncle Darrow's Cajun cuisine. Uh, Norwood, are you here with us? Uh, we also have Greg Doolin, who is a legend, uh, soul food legend in Los Angeles. Uh, what I, I had his food, loved it. So we're glad that you're here with us as well. And uh, I see that we have Kim Prince uh, with you also. So thank you, Kim, for being with us today. Uh, you know, she's part of the, the hot chicken, the legit hot chicken family. So she's bringing that flavor to Los Angeles. So we're glad to see you here as well. Um, also have uh, Gail Jennings. With King's Pepper Spice Blends, also with Black Arts Los Angeles. Um, Brad Johnson uh, with Post and Beam Hospitality. Yay. Yep. And we have, thank you, uh, Brad, for being with us. We also have Desiree Edwards with the Coffee Shop. Thank you, Desiree, for being with us. Um, I think that's our, that's our group. So um, we're going to, what I'm going to do is just ask questions and then I'm just gonna uh, call on you all to just give some answers and then um, that's how we'll do tonight. So um, appreciate y'all being with us today. So first of all, the news that Juneteenth is a federal holiday. I mean, when we first planned this, we didn't know that was gonna happen. And that happens uh, so just in time for the, the holiday. So I think the first question just to start off is just to talk about what Juneteenth means to you. So I'm gonna start with Kevin Bledsoe because he's a Texas brother. So Kevin, why don't you uh, tell us what Juneteenth means to you? Oh man, like, well, you know, I'm a Compton boy at heart, but I, you know, spent all my summers in Texas. So, and my mom's and pops is from Texas. So, uh, you know, I knew it firsthand. We used to celebrate it in LA, you know, family picnics and all that. And then, you know, our family reunion in Texas used to always be uh, Juneteenth. So uh, my granny and my aunties and uncles was dropping knowledge about it way back in the day, you know, so. Uh, it was always just a time for family, man. It was celebration and uh, right on to the holiday. It's well overdue, but I still take it. But uh, I mean, that is something to freedom is always something to be celebrated, you know, and uh, good food, good family, good stories and all that. I mean, and when I was a kid, you know, we're real young, we actually had, you know, some slave survivors, you know, that came to the reunion, you know, like, uh, 
second generations, mom and dads were slaves and, and spoke on certain things about Juneteenth and, uh, and uh, you know, Texas and Galveston and all that. So uh, it's, it's rich in our heritage and um, I'm proud to be part of it. Yeah. And I, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention this. You have a, you have a barbecue restaurant, you have one in Compton, and now you have one uh, still in L.A. So you want to tell us a little bit about your business? Oh, yeah, we have one in Hollywood. We have one at the Proud Bird. Uh, we have one at the uh, L.A. Bank Stadium. And we have one at uh, in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, so we got to we stretched out a little bit, uh, you know, so we're doing our thing. But like I said, we started in Compton way back in uh, 08 and we've just been pushing ever since. Yep. And you ship nationwide. I want people to know that, too. <laughs> All day. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, Desiree Edwards, why don't you tell us what Juneteenth means to you? Oh, did we just lose her? All right. Well, oh, OK, Ms. Edwards, yeah. Go I'm ahead. back. Hey, good evening, everyone. Glad to be here with this esteemed panel. Um, but it means freedom to me. It means celebrating with my own. And, um, you know, it's a reminder that we really don't have the freedom that we're supposed to have. But I look forward to the barbecue, watermelon, and the red soda water in abundance, you know, among people that I love and people that I meet during this time of celebration. You know, my mom is from the Bay Area, so they've always celebrated Juneteenth in a very big way in the Bay. So, I have some very fond memories. You know, I've never celebrated it on a large scale in Los Angeles, but the Bay Area, I have a lot of great memories, a lot of free concert, a days in the park, and you know, just having a good, big, giant family reunion with a bunch of people I know and don't know. <laughs> That's great. All right, how about let's go to uh, Kim Prince and Greg Doolin. Uh, you all are together. Why don't you tell us what uh, Jim means to you? And also, for all those who are not uh, being interviewed right now, if you could put your uh, mic on mute, that would help. Thank you. Well, hey, y'all. Um, Juneteenth for me is a new holiday. Um, it wasn't something that my family would gather and celebrate in name uh, as Juneteenth. Um, back in Nashville, Tennessee, our family always gathered. However, um, it was, since it was around Father's Day weekend, um, I was just used to gathering with the family. It wasn't until I was in college at Fresno State University that I first heard the term Juneteenth. And uh, I remember this was back in the 90s, uh, they would have a celebration on the campus at our school. And that was my first time seeing anybody ever say anything about Juneteenth and what it meant. And that's being from the South. You know, a lot of people would assume that we would have known, but we did not know anything about Juneteenth till the 90s for me. And so I've always enjoyed, uh, you know, picnics and watermelon and red velvet cake, red beans and rice, and all those other wonderful red dishes. Uh, you know, sometimes we had gumbo and etouffee uh, while we were uh, visiting different ones that lived in the Fresno area, Central California. So it's definitely something that's west of the Mississippi centric, I would think, um, back in the 90s up until uh, recent, where now we're hearing about Juneteenth all the time. So I'm happy to say that at Highville Chicken, we have celebrated, this will be our second Juneteenth, and we participate in a Pies for Justice event that uh, raises funds to support not just the holiday, but movements like Black Lives Matter and um, some grocery organizations that are out there too to make sure we are able to feed the community. Go ahead. And uh, thank you. I'm, I'm really happy to be on this, this esteemed panel. I think someone referred to it that way a few minutes ago. Uh, so Juneteenth, you know, my family has been in the soul food business for you know a few decades in Los Angeles. And I can tell you that Juneteenth wasn't something that was really widely celebrated in Los Angeles. Uh, in fact, we hadn't heard about, we, we didn't really start hearing about Juneteenth uh, until relatively recently. And uh, now it has taken off, and especially with the new recognition as a national holiday, it gives us an opportunity to go back in history and think about what it must have felt like to have those Union soldiers uh, travel to Texas and to make that announcement that you are free that you are no longer
slaves, you are free. And, and I was just trying to just imagine what that must have felt like, you know. So uh, for me, Juneteenth is, is recognition of our contribution to this, to this country. It is a time to eat some good food, soul food, preferably. And, uh, you know, and it's, and it's just putting our story on a national and worldwide stage. And so it's, it's something that, that's a long time coming and I'm very, very happy for it. And, it's, and it's, it has created a lot of catering orders for me for this week. <laughs> oh, I like to hear that cash register ring. So I'm glad to hear that. All right. Uh, Brad Johnson, could you tell us what Juneteenth means to you? Sure, and uh, I echo Greg's uh, sentiments. I'm honored to be a part of this. Hey, Greg. Hey, Kim. Good to see y'all. Good to see everybody else here. Um, you know, I was I was in a conversation recently with Melba Wilson, who owns Melba's in Harlem, and this was uh, in the midst of uh, COVID with all that was going on. And uh, you know, everybody in the restaurant industry had their hands full, as did you know the entire world. But it seemed to hit our industry particularly hard and as black operators, um, you know, we feel everything acutely. And she had one particular morning that she came out and she was struggling to just get it together and, and you know, wondering if she was gonna be able to make it, um, make, make payroll, make rent, make, you know, just, just keep the lights on. And outside of her restaurant, between her restaurant and her home was a statue of Harriet Tubman. And she said when she when she saw that statue that particular morning, she stopped and she stood and she stared at it. And as we all do, I think we gather strength from our ancestors. And she gathered strength that morning from her ancestors. Juneteenth was not something that that I'm from New York, wasn't a very well known uh, um, day to celebrate. Um, but as we are now emerging into this new era post-COVID, post the pandemic, and a new era of awareness of the contribution of African-Americans to the culinary journey in this country. Adrian, your fine book is an example of that. Greg and Kim, your family's legacy is, is very much a part of that. Uh, Brother Bloodslow, your, your fine restaurant and expanding around the world and delivering the message about the food around the world is certainly a part of that. Brother Norwood, what you've continued to do through all these years in LA, um, all of these conversations are important. Martin Luther King talked a lot about freedom back in the day, and we literally had to fight for that freedom. But I think now we're at a point where we've got to push beyond the conversation about freedom. And I think that's the next, that's the next, next task at hand. So kudos to President Biden. I'm glad we have Juneteenth to celebrate. And I think that celebration should reverberate around the globe, but we have work to do. Amen. Amen. All right. Do we have uh, Norwood with us? Do we have Brother Norwood with us, Brother Norwood Clark? Okay. If not, I will turn to Gail Jennings. Uh, so good to see you here. Uh, thanks for being here. I, I introduced you uh, in absentia, but I'm glad you're connected. And you know, you are part. Of, yeah, you're part of the Black Arts uh, Los Angeles, and you're part of the one of the co-organizers of the. Juneteenth celebration. So why don't you tell us about your connection to Juneteenth and what it means to you? Well, Juneteenth is very personal to me because I'm a Juneteenth descendant like some of the others on, on the panel, particularly, I guess, uh, uh, Kevin, and have um, a deep connection because my parents, uh, my great-great-grandparents were emancipated on June 19th, 1865 in Crockett, Texas and had been enslaved for decades because they were part of that wave. They belonged, they were enslaved by people who marched them from Alabama and Mississippi so that they could keep their enslaved people as Texas became a state and entered the union. So they had been enslaved for a long, long time. Oh no, I guess we lost her. Well, we'll when we get her back, we'll uh, let her finish out what she was saying. I do want to pivot for a moment right now. And so let me go to you, Desiree Edwards. And uh, I want to ask you uh, in this moment, kind of, uh, we've spent a year talking about uh, racial justice. There was a, a rush to amplify black creatives and support black businesses. 
I'm wondering, what do you see as um, ways that people could amplify what you do in your business? How can people support you? Do we have Desiree Edwards here? No. Oh, is it just me? Maybe we lost everybody. I'm still here, Adrian Brad. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, we'll all see. right. Okay. I see you all now. Uh, I don't know, Desiree Edwards, I don't know if you heard uh, my question, but I was asking uh, in this moment, what can you do to amplify your business and support you? Continue the support that I have. I've been very fortunate throughout the entire pandemic that I was never closed. So you know, the support that I had was outstanding, and I just need that to continue. And we move forward. We hit, hit the ground moving the other day. I'm absolutely exhausted. And Saturday is going to be a, a key day for us. I hope you, you know, despite the one when Obama won the first election. You're waiting for that spirit of business, huh? Yeah. Okay. Well, great. Thank me? you. So, uh, well, go ahead. I, I just said you're waiting for that surge of business huh, on Saturday. All right. Well, thank you. All right, Kevin, uh, you know, you're in the barbecue two, space. You know, so. Oh, okay. Uh, so, Kevin, you know, you're in the barbecue space. I uh, saw you on the Great American Barbecue Showdown. Um, I love the visibility that you're getting, brother. So, uh, you know, you're expanding your business. You're going around the world. What else can people do to support you and amplify your business? <clears throat> I mean, I, I, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll rebound off what Desiree said, man. We've been uh, so blessed. We never closed the uh, Hollywood location during the uh, pandemic. And we, you know, we were able to help so many people and so many other restaurants during the uh, pandemic. Uh, so, you know, we were well supported and I was able to help some old brothers and sisters who restaurants were struggling, whether it was helping them out with, with food or, you know, a couple of dollars or guiding them to the right people to get the loans and things that wasn't, that we wasn't getting at first when the pandemic started. And uh, I got gratification from that, you know, most of the time, cause you know, we were really blessed and, Kingsford looked out for us and a couple of other big name companies looked out for us and enabled us to look out for other people. So, you know, my blessing came from high on that and we, we was able to roll through the, uh, the pandemic. Glad to hear that. Oh, Gail, you're back with us. Do you want to yep. uh, finish telling us about your connection to Juneteenth? And as soon as I said that, okay, there you go, Gail, it right. over to you. Well, I, I've been listening to what others have been saying, and Desiree, we're really excited to be in Watts this year. We're going to uh, be in um, the Ted Watkins Park. Uh, Black Arts Los Angeles gave, um, you might say, gave rise to Lamert Park Rising. We went to Jonathan Leonard and said to him, we want to have uh, the event in Lamert Park on a weekend. And, you know, he was gracious. He had been doing Juneteenth you know, on June 19th only. And so we expanded it. And this year we're going to be there when Styx receives the key to the city. And All right, well, we're having a few more difficulties with Gail. We hope to get her back. Uh, I want to go to you, Brad Johnson. Uh, you know, Post and Beam, fine dining setting. Can you talk to us about the challenges you had? Because just as a as a person on the outside, it seemed like fine dining. You know, people that really rely on people being in the restaurant um, really struggled. And I wondered if that was your case. And you know, how can what, how can we support you and amplify your business? Well, I actually sold Post and Beam to John Cleveland in the summer of uh, 2019. So we missed uh, the pandemic. I'd owned it for the prior eight years, nine years. And John's been the owner since. Um, but I did consult with him all along the way. And, you know, the challenges that, that John dealt with in fine dining were, you know, some of the major were already in the pipeline, right, with issues around hiring, issues around rising minimum wage, and labor expenses accelerating. Um, and the, the pandemic just really put all of those things into the, uh, the forefront. 
So I can tell you that, you know, the opening, the, the inconsistent, I mean, you know, not to, not to blame the local government, because I think in the beginning we were, and probably throughout, we were getting at best mixed messages from, uh, from the government, you know, nationally and locally. Um, the mayor was, and governors of every state were trying to do their best in reacting, you know, and, and not harming businesses. And I think L.A. got some things right and they got some things wrong. And the openings and the closings were difficult because I know in John's case with Post and Beam, um, you know, when, when outdoor dining was approved for a period of time, he went out, bought a big, beautiful tent, put it up in the parking lot to accommodate uh, outside dining. And then dining got shut back down. He had ordered a whole bunch of food, had gone through the expense of, of bringing people back to work and uh, the expense of the tent, and then there was no revenue to follow that. So, you know, I, I think that this year just taught everybody, you know, anybody who's been in the restaurant business at all knows that if it's known for anything, it's known for throwing you some curveballs. So um, you learn to think on your feet, and I think that uh, us as African-American uh, restaurateurs and operators, we're pretty resilient. And, uh, you know, we're used to dealing with um, conditions that can be challenging. And, and I think this was certainly the case with uh, the pandemic this year. But I'm very pleased to say that John has come through it, Post and Bean is busy. And um, I think folks are anxious to be out. And uh, fortunately, uh, John's doing well and, and managed to hang in there. OK, great. So uh, what are you doing now and how can we support you now in your current endeavors? Um, I am taking a taking a breather, Adrian. I've been in the restaurant business. I'm a second generation restaurateur, as is Greg, as is Kim. And, um, you know, I'm taking a little break. And I started a podcast called Corner Table Talk, uh, primarily centered around issues um, relative to food, drinking culture. But that's pretty expansive. I've had guests from ta Coast to Danny Glover to uh, John and Gobin, who were my partners at uh, at Post and Bean. Uh, I hope to have Greg and Kim. And uh, so I'm, I'm in the podcast game. So you can tune in on your favorite uh, platform to listen to, to podcasts and, and give me a, a thumbs up. All right. That sounds good. Now, when you're saying you're taking a breather, is that an invitation for us to vacation with you or am I reading uh, too much of that? Of course. Yes. <laughs> you are certainly welcome to join me. I'm currently in Miami, Florida. I uh, bought a house down here recently, and uh, Miami's an interesting city. I've been visiting for a long time, so absolutely welcome to come down here, man. And I had dinner at Red Rooster, Marcus Samuels' restaurant, uh, a week or so ago, and it's a beautiful, beautiful spot over in Overtown. So there's, there's a lot going on, on down here. All right, nice. All right, I want to get to Kim Prince and Greg Doolin. I want to pivot and uh, talk about kind of African heritage cuisines, as I call them in the United States. So one of the most prominent ones is soul food. Uh, and Greg Doolin, you've been in that space for a while. So what, what do you think is going on with soul food these days in terms of customer perceptions, appreciation? Um, and, and do you see any future trends emerging with, with soul food? I'm just curious what your take is. Uh, soul food is uh, alive and well in, in America. Uh, we are, you know, we haven't skipped a beat during the pandemic. Uh, soul food is that traditional food that a lot of us grew up eating, our parents grew up eating, and our parents' parents grew up eating. So it's it's deep within our roots, and I believe it's 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 here to stay. Uh, soul food is a uh, a tourist attraction, if you will. Uh, there are a lot. There's a lot of soul food tourism. Uh, in America. And so often when folks go to a, a city, uh, and maybe some of you all have experienced this, uh, they'll ask, well, where's the best soul food in town? And that question gets asked a lot when people visit Los Angeles. Fortunately, uh, if we're lucky, they'll show up at one of our Doolin's uh, locations. Um, soul food, you know, particularly with the, the unrest and, and, and the things that happened in 2020, uh, you know, there was a, a, a surge in popularity, you know, in spite of the, the pandemic, uh, people were looking to support, you know, soul food and, and black owned uh, restaurants. And we just we experienced a tremendous outpouring of support uh, 
philanthropy uh, and, and just, uh, you know, uh, and we were able to, to, to give that back to the community in, in, in the form of providing meals to seniors, senior citizens in Los Angeles. Uh, I think the soul food business is, is, is uh, here to stay. Uh, you know, just like other ethnic cuisines, you know, Chinese, uh, Mexican, Italian, uh, soul food is a staple in America. And, and, and I believe there'll always be a segment of, of the country of Americans that want, that want to eat the food. So let me follow up on that real quick. So one thing that has uh, puzzled me is why there's there, we don't have a national soul food chain. Uh, do you think that's a possibility? You know, many have tried. I don't want to do it, but uh, you know, it's a uh, it's a uh, that's a joke. But it's it's a tough business. Uh, and you know, Brad mentioned the rising costs. Uh, soul food menus are typically very protein heavy. Uh, they can be labor intensive with all the dishes that we have to cook. And so, you know, and, and the, the cooking of the food is very personalized. And so being able to duplicate that across the country and have that same personal uh, feeling of, of a Kim Prince coming and saying, hey, y'all, how y'all doing today? That's not easy to duplicate uh, on, a, on a national scale. Uh, you guys remember the Black IP restaurant? Uh, that is the only national chain that I can ever remember that actually made a good, they did, they, they made a good stab at it, but for, ever, for, for whatever reason, it, uh, it's, it's just tough, but it's, it's possible. It's possible. Okay. It's possible. Mm -hmm. So Cam, you know, I, I have to go here. So there's so many people doing Nashville hot, whatever. Uh, even in Denver, we have Nashville hot chicharrones and oysters, that kind of thing. So uh, give us your perspective on this trend. Uh, and, and, you know, wh how, how do you see yourself in this space as the uh, one of the guardians of the legit version of this? So I'm just wondering what's going through your mind these days. Adrian, that was a perfect segue. I like the word guardian. Thank you uh, for using that term uh, because it's uh, something about a unique fingerprint, and the Prince family has definitely has has authentic, unique fingerprint when it comes to how to telling the story of National Hot Chicken and how the business came to be, um, being the first family to do it. So uh, as far back as we've been able to record, uh, we're the first family in America to do National Hot Chicken as a business. So I'm very very proud. Uh, I don't. Uh, the title of being yeah, hot chicken royalty lightly because uh, with it comes weight uh, of having to maintain uh, the authenticity of how it's prepared and uh, an expectation of upholding the legacy of the Prince family and starting that business back in the 1930s. And I'm here on the West Coast. So I'm a long way from home. But uh, I've always said that National Hot Chicken I don't know that my great great uncle Florden would have thought that it would have been on practically on every continent in uh, on the globe, but I can venture to tell you that dang there is. <laughs> it may not be in Antarctica, but uh, be a cool place to eat. So it's um, and then I like to say that we've inspired a lot of people to do Nashville hot chicken. Um, it's, it's taken on different forms and interpretations, which is wonderful to see. Even on the hot grilled chicken menu, we've got a secret menu where we do tacos and taquitos. That's a definite Western or Southwest influence uh, on my menu that we're doing here in California that you won't find in Nashville. Uh, the family restaurant, Princess Hot Chicken, is not doing that just yet. But um, there's lots of cool ways to massage National Hot Chicken into just about any dish out there. And that's what we're seeing. Uh, I get invitations all the time, even in, in Australia where Kevin had the place. Um, you know, like there's tons of National Hot Chicken there uh, and other places across the world uh, that I've yet to get to. I would love to go travel and visit a lot of them uh, just to sample and try it out. Um, the unique spins on it is a uh, 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 is a feather in a cap, I think, and I, I would like to believe that my ancestors are in their graves or applauding from the thrones of heaven, saying uh, "Bravo, Bravo, keep going, keep going, keep going," and to think that it was just 
a little bit of pepper trying to get back at a man for not being so faithful, returning to what it is right now. Uh, before I move on from you, I'm just curious, uh, what do you see is, in terms of plant-based uh, menu items? Are you are you pivoting to doing more plant-based stuff? Are you because uh, I've seen that as a trend in a lot of places. I'm just wondering if the two of you are, are really thinking about that right now. I can say absolutely. Uh, you can go to I Bill today and ask for a plant-based uh, sandwich, and we'll provide you one because it is on the it's not typed out on the menu. But if that's what you got a craving for, I can definitely fulfill that. So we do have a plant-based uh, menu right now. Okay, and that's something that we've explored at Doolin's, and uh, you know that look look for something uh, coming down the pipeline in the future. Okay. Uh, will we also see potato salad with raisins in it? Is that going to be on your menu? Uh, no. <laughs> hey, I, if, I, if I may, I know Kevin. Here we go. Here we go. Yes. Brother Kevin and I were just oh. on the panel uh, recently, and the question about raisins and the topic of potato salad came up and what was put in it. So I, I've never had potato salad with raisins in it. I've had some other salads that had raisins in it. So it's a very puzzling thing that makes me scratch my brain to understand why people do that. But they didn't do it in Nashville, I can tell you that much. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, so. Nor did we put celery in our potato salad. We put celery. Okay. Celery goes in potato salad. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I created some controversy now. Yeah, we got boxing gloves on that one. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so Kevin, I want to ask you real quick if uh, you see more plant-based items in barbecue. And then we're gonna go back to Gail, and then we're, I think Brother Norwood Clark is here, so we want to give him a moment. So, Kevin, are you seeing plant based barbecue or, yeah, plant based barbecue? I'm not doing it. I don't see it. I mean, we have one little thing we do, uh, Texas caviar. That's cool. I always feel like whatever I'm gonna try to do, I'm gonna try to do the best. I'm the best at barbecue, and I feel like somebody who really wants to let share or plant based stuff, they're gonna go to the place that's good at that. So, I can't get no meat at no vegetarian restaurant, so they can't get no uh, vegetarian stuff in my restaurant. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right, Gail Jennings. Uh, I think we have a stable connection. So we want to hear more about King's Pepper Spice Blend and uh, what else you got going on. How can we amplify your business? We have a plant based taco kit, the African taco kit. And uh, it's available at kingspepper.com. It uses black eyed peas, which is, you know, tied right into my heritage. My background, you make a batter and you fry it into these crispy little vegan patties. And it's wonderful. I'm really selling a lot of these. Now, were you inspired to do that for other reasons? Or were, was, was it the fact that customers were coming to you and asking for a plant-based oh, we, needed, we needed something to sell at the first Juneteenth we did in Levert Park. And so I okay. said, you know what, Moza? I'm going to do this African taco that I, you know, th that I make. And it was a hit. But just last year, I created this this kit. You know, I have a commercial kitchen now and everything. And so I came up with the kit. And um, so there's this, you know, this plant-based option that to me is tied, is uniquely tied to my Juneteenth experience. Okay, great. All right, let me go to uh, Brother Norwood Clark. We're so glad you are with us. Uh, so a, couple, a few questions for you. First of all, thanks for being here. So one thing is um, I wanted to ask you, you know, Juneteenth is now a federal holiday. So what does that mean to you? And then the second question I would like you to answer is, you know, tell us about a little bit about your business and how we could support you and amplify what you do. Well, first of all, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, my apologies for my tardiness. Had problems finding the link. And also we opened today, too. So this is the first day of the week. Uh, that we open. So we've been opening uh, Thursdays through Sundays, uh, Thursdays, four to seven, uh, Friday, Saturdays, uh, noon to seven and Sundays, noon to six. I don't know if any other restaurant tour is having the same uh, challenges that we're having manpower. Can't seem to find people to work, especially with the unemployment benefits being so strong. And so that's one of the major challenges that we have here uh, at our location. Uh, the quick backstory about myself, uh, born in New Orleans, and my family used to cook for the world-renowned Commander's Palace. Over 27 years, my family cooked there. They trained Paul Perdon, Emma Lagasse, and I used to work for the Hilton family. And then we first started making candy, the pecan candy, the pralines. And we had those in all the Nordstroms in California, Oak Brook, Illinois, 
uh, Minneapolis, Neiman Marcus, and Beverly Hills. And then we opened our first location in Mid City. Um, then Marina Del Rey, Mr. Johnson, uh, Mr. Doolin, and all the Watts Coffee House, and Gail, and all of the folks on the panel, uh, major, major supporters of us, especially being a first generation family business. And so we couldn't navigate this without the benevolence of the panel that you have there. And in terms of Juneteenth, um, I mean, it's amazing. I grew up doing segregation in Louisiana. I went to segregated schools, walked through the back door, drank from the colored water fountain, rode on the back of the bus. Uh, my grandfather, my dad's father, his parents were slaves. So my dad's grandparents were slaves and my great grandparents were slaves. So it's amazing how not far removed we are, you know, we're so close to it. And so to have this to be made a federal mm -hmm. holiday is long and coming, but appreciated anyway. And so it's a situation where we're just going to honor it in the best way that we can and by honoring the holidays, honoring us. Uh, that's the way that I want to do it. You know, every every male, female of color, uh, Native African American here just want to pay honor to them and for the sacrifice ancestors made. So that's where we are. Thank you. And I'm glad you mentioned that point because I don't think a lot of people realize how close we are to slavery and, and even closer to segregation. They think it's like something that was long ago and that's not the case. So thank you for that. And I was really, um, I, I don't know if you heard this earlier, but Kevin Bloodso was talking about some of the Juneteenth celebrations he went to enslaved people or those who were related to them were there to give testimony so that we wouldn't forget uh, sure. what that is. Was like, so thank you. Okay, so everybody, I want you to think about this question. I'm going to start with Desiree Edwards first, but um, who are people in Black creatives or Black people in the food space who you respect, uh, you know, really admire that other people may not know about? We want to give them some recognition. So who are the ones to watch? So how about you, Desiree? Oh, boy. Wow. You, I mean, honestly, you look looking at everybody. Um, Greg... Norwood and I started together in a black restaurant association. We were the incubator start at the Black Expo, um, tasting black food for together. So I've been with these guys. Oh, wow. I mean, and then we have um, Adolph Doolin. You know, I frequent his hamburger city over on Santa Barbara. You know, I grew up in a time where we had some really good food in LA, and then they came along and hit us with unkissies, and we couldn't get enough of that. So, you know, I've been among some very phenomenal restaurant tours, and you know, it's been a blessing because I've watched them shine, I watched them shoot for the moon, and achieve so much success, like um, Kevin Bloodsoul. We had our piece from his place last 4th of July because he has a great barbecue. Thank you. Uh, Brad Johnson, how about you? Who should we be watching for? Um, you know, Adrian, I was thinking about what you were saying, you know, and, and you know, in our industry, there's always this tendency to talk about scale, right? And you asked the question, how come there isn't a national soul food chain? And you know, as I'm thinking about that and, and listening to the panel and looking at who is on this panel, I also patronized, you know, Aunt Kizzy's when I moved from New York to Los Angeles, uh, Greg's dad's spot in Marina Del Rey was like my home away from home. And more times than not, when I went there, um, Adolph was, was there and I developed a rapport with him and, and uh, subsequently with Greg and our families made a connection and he came to my place, Craig comes to my place, I go to his place. And on some level, man, I think that that's what our food and our culture craves. And, you know, coming out of this pandemic and all of the things that we were all rushing to and, and trying to get done going in, it was like a big pause button. And if you take a step back and you ask yourself, what do you really miss? You know, you miss that human connection. You miss that place that you walk in and they know your name or they, you know, give you a pound and a, a hug or ask you how, you, you know, sorry to hear about, you know, your, your family that passed away or that's what we do with each other. And so I guess maybe this is not quite an answer to your who we should support other than to say that I think in each city there exists, as your book 
demonstrates, Adrian, and, and, and Greg, you've traveled around, your pops, how I met your father. He came to New York to seek out Black-owned restaurants. And Greg, I know you do that as well. I think that that's how we stay connected. And I love the fact that each city has its own independent Black-owned restaurant scene. And I think if we could do anything to elevate and identify those places to make sure that we continue to stay connected nationally that way, I think that's that's something that uh, I would love I would love to uh, continue to try to amplify. Great, thank you, uh, Gail. Who who should we give some shine? Who's on your radar screen? You know, listen. Speaking of shine, I want to thank you first, Adrian, for agreeing to be the moderator of this, and everyone on the panel. Uh, we are, um, you know, as as someone said, um, soul food. You know, it, it's really connected with the soul, and word of mouth is very strong. And so, I, I see several of you on the panel that I've got to, you know, I've got to reach out to you and and um, and, and uh, try the food. But the writers, the people getting the the work done on television and those public spaces are really helping to lift, I think, you know, it's that rising tide that's lifting all boats. And I appreciate, you know, that you all have been in the game and staying in there, man. not new to it, but true to it, as they say. And uh, King's Pepper, I, yesterday I sold pepper to a woman who had been looking for me for 20 years. She tried King's Pepper back in the day when I lived here in Los Angeles and finally found me on, on online. And so, you know, it was a testament to you know, the, not you know, just the quality of the of the product, but the connection to the products, and I really appreciated that. Great, hey Kevin, why don't you tell us a little bit? You're involved with the Preserve the Pit Initiative, correct? With Kingsford. Um, oh, you're on you're on mute. Must have been in here cussing. Uh, yep. The Preserve the uh, Pit is a Kingsford, a uh, uh, very exciting program that I'm part of, which is a. Uh, bringing in young African-American pit masters and helping them, you know, I know all of us, like I know, I can't say all, but I know I started off on a shoestring budget and uh, uh, struggled and, and learning the, the hardest part about being a restaurant owner is most of us as the owners start off as the cooks. And as you're in there cooking, trying to make a, a great, great product and this and that, this and that, sometimes the business aspect can go, you know, get on the back burner. And that's what can uh, catch up with you and burn you up. So Preserve the Pit are bringing these youngsters in, and not, not really young, just whoever, uh, and training them from start to finish. We have mentors in every aspect of the barbecue business. And uh, one, of, one of the girls who actually made it, Shalomar Lang from My Father's Barbecue, uh, she made the, uh, the, the top three. And uh, so, and I'm one of her mentors right now. And she made the top three out of like almost two or 3,000 applicants. And right now she's getting some of the best uh, knowledge in the world on every aspect of the restaurant business. Cause you know, as we know, most restaurants fail the first year, especially our restaurants. And uh, I mean, I can go on all day about it, but uh, Preserve the Pit Kingsford has stepped up, you know, a lot of, Companies just give money to the African American uh, community and keep it pushing, but uh, you know they're embedded in the African American community right now, and I'm just glad to be a a part of it. And not to jump off that, but if I had to shoot out, I'm, I can't shoot out too many people because you don't want nobody to get mad uh, or shout out that you don't say. But uh, I'm with you know, like I say, I support everybody on this panel. My parents do. My father has been going to Doolin's for years. I've been going. Uh, every time I'm in there, if I slip in, I get me some hot chicken. I've, I've sat down and talked to Norwood. I love salmon croquette at the Waffle House. I mean, at a Desiree the Box Coffee House. Uh, I've been to all of them, and that's the only way we can do it, and that's the only way we can make it, and that's the only way it's working together. And me and uh, Kim uh, spoke on this the other day, and and like when we talk about soul food. And a lot of times I don't understand where this negative stigma comes in on our food. Oh, it's fattening. Oh, it's this and that. And I always ask this question. I asked this question on a show the other day. And I said, what cultural food is good for you? You understand what I'm saying? Anything is not good for you. Everything has to be done in moderation. So why do we attack 
our food all the time. I'm not eating chitlins every single day. I'm not eating oxtails every day. But when I eat them, I'm going to give props to my folks. And I know that's all we had to eat. And on soul food, our people was living to be going through the rough time, the highest stress in the world, was living to be 100 years old off of it. So I'm cool with it. And like I say, we got to speak on it. You know, not everything has to be done in modern, every culture. And we always get on talking about other people's food. We always do. But then when it comes time to talk about our food, we go with the... Uh, with the BS, oh, it's too fat, and oh, it's this and it's that, and go right home and eat a pork chop sandwich with two pieces of bread and Louisiana hot sauce right on it at 12 midnight. <laughs> that'll preach, that'll preach. <laughs> so, uh, Kim and Greg, how about you all? Who are you looking at these days? Um, who should we know about? You want me to go first? I, go? I, I, I. I like that pork chop sandwich. That might be a special <laughs> special on my menu next week. Uh, first of all, uh, let me just say that I have a picture that I'm very proud of. And it's a picture uh, with my two mentors. On one side of me is my father, the late Adolph Doolin, the king of soul food. And on the other side is Brad Johnson. And the picture was taken at Post and Bing. And I had the privilege of having both of these gentlemen in my in my ear, uh, with obviously with my dad from from, from birth, and so uh, I'll, I'll always appreciate that. Uh, as it relates to who we should look at, uh, they're not in the soul food game, mm -hmm. but this young uh, group of of restaurateurs are going to blow up in the United States. And Kim, you know who I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. They're from Nashville, Tennessee, and their company is called what? Slim and Husky. Slim and Husky. Yeah. And they do a pizza. They're in the pizza business, but they do a pizza that is out of this world. And um, they, uh, they're they growing. They're growing nationally. And eight locations. Yeah. Eight locations. They're growing really fast. Uh, they just partnered with Kevin Johnson, the former mayor of South Sacramento uh, and, and open the location in their first California location. And uh, uh, that, you know, that's a, that's a young group to watch. The other uh, business I would say to watch would be Hot Bill Chicken. And I'm sitting next to my partner uh, right now, Hot Bill Chicken. We talked about the growth of Nashville Hot Chicken. But Hot Bill has something unique. Hot Bill has uh, one of the original spokespersons who can claim roots to Nashville hot chicken. And not only can she claim roots, uh, but she does it eloquently. She does it with a smile, with a charm and a grace that just, uh, you know, the, the customers just, just love her. Uh, the, right. the concept <laughs> is, is, is not that difficult to duplicate. You know, it's not as it's not as tough as, as let's say soul food, soul food menu. Right. The menu is not as as uh, as as demanding as a, a full soul food menu, and so hot bill chicken, uh, you know, has legs and uh, has potential for growth, and, and we're actually planning for that growth. And 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 I'm gonna I'm gonna go back on what I said. Doolin soul food can grow. We can grow, and we have a new. We discovered a new method of serving that just just came out of the pandemic that is really working. And this particular, uh, the way we're serving now, uh, and we're able to serve people faster, uh, we can uh, we can grow Doolin's as well. So uh, Hot Bill Chicken, Slim and Husky, you may not have heard of, and who knows, maybe Doolin's Soul Food. Um, yeah, 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 I would love to add, um, you know, honors, uh, to all the those who started in the business of the food space before us, uh, but I'm always looking at the next generation of young chefs that are out there. Uh, some culinary trained, some backyard trained, some of them trained in the church kitchens. Uh, but whatever the case may be, uh, Los Angeles, uh, I'm, I'm meeting lots of new restaurant, uh, future restaurant owners. Uh, uh, they just need to uh, get access to some resources 
and then get some strong mentors like all of you on this panel uh, to uh, get in your shadows and up on your wing and under your tutelage. Uh, it, it took partnership for uh, Highville to really get the uh, bandwidth that it has uh, to root itself in Los Angeles the way it has so far. Um, I knew it had it had the wings, but uh, so to speak, the chicken. But uh, you know, chickens don't fly, do they? <laughs> so we had to to partner up uh, because coming from Nashville, I didn't know the temperature of the water here. So um, with that in mind, I do believe in mentorship. Uh, but there are some young chefs out there. Uh, there's a young man named Will Allen. He has a restaurant called well, he has a pop up restaurant, I should say, uh, called Fowl and Fair, and uh, he has reached out to me and very inspired and moved by the steps that I have taken to get Hotville to where it is. And uh, he's doing this. He's going through the same pace as I did. Started with a pop-up, going to rent out a kitchen. He's doing weekend events. And uh, I met with him. He's from the Oakland area and he came down just like a week or so ago uh, to meet me in person. And we sat down and had a long talk about how to best get his menu uh, into the bellies of the people who want it most. Uh, there's several other restaurants here in Los Angeles uh, besides the ones that the ones on the panel own. But, uh, you know, I uh, adore uh, chefs like Naisha Arrington. Um, she used to have a restaurant called uh, Native. Uh, Chef Elaine Smith, who had a restaurant before uh, in the heart of Hollywood, it took 10 years to get it off the ground. It's, no longer there, but uh, Chef Elaine Smith is, um, she had Soul Restaurant in, in Hollywood. Uh, Jeff Jeff Full of Love, Jason, Jason Full of Love, I'm sorry, Jason Full of Love, who had Barbara Jean. Um, and I hate to think that so many of these restaurants that that, uh, that come to mind for me are, you know, no longer. And it makes me question why that is. Uh, surely we can have testimonies to say that we're, we've been around for 30, 40 years, uh, like many of those on this panel, 20 years, you know, a decade or more. But there are some youngsters out there, including myself, that definitely need um, your your support and want to, you know, get your guidance. And, you know, there's something that we have to add to, you know, there's a food truck space. Uh, Greg and I have a food truck now called Doolinville. Uh, we're collaborating. Collaboration is a strong word um, among the next generation, and they are getting together and mobilizing themselves. Brad Johnson, you mentioned it. Food gathers people around. That's what we do as black folk. We come together, and if you put a little bit of fried chicken and cornbread, black eyed peas in the middle of the table, I bet you we can come up with some great ideas on how we can formalize unify and create a very strong presence and be loud about it. That's something that we have to do now that we have to take ownership of what it is we created. Uh, I'm really honored to uh, to be able to represent my family. Uh, but we do more than just fried chicken. And some of the young chefs that are coming up behind us are uh, really good at what they do, really good at what they do. But I can't name them all. There's a long laundry list of uh, great restaurant owners that are you got to be bold to get into this am i right y'all you, you gotta be you, you gotta have some some, some grit and, gr and brawn to jump into opening up a restaurant um and then and then just wake up in the skin that we're in and i'm proud of my skin i wouldn't change it for a thing but uh there's you know trials that come with being black there's trials that come with being a black business owner and particularly being a restaurant owner, um, add to that being a woman of color and all these other things that are getting a lot of attention now. So um, kudos to everybody, I guess, to all of you. Thank you. All right, Norwood, I'm gonna ask you two questions. I want you to also you know, tell us about people who need some shine. And then I like to end my panel discussions with a benediction. So. Uh, the question, this is going to be for everybody. I'm going to call you and ask you the same question, but uh, knowing what you know now, what would you have told your previous self who was just getting in this business? What, what's the advice you would give that that previous self? <laughs> so go ahead. And you're on, you're on mute. You're on mute still. You hear me now? You're good. Oh, now, now you muted again. 
All right, now you're good. Okay. Uh, other than standing corporate America, <laughs> no, it's it's been an interesting journey for me coming out of corporate America and getting into entrepreneurship. I think I would have uh, seeked out mentors in the very beginning, uh, not coming from a business background. Uh, I would have sought professionals in the industry that I was in instead of flying blindly, which costs us a lot of money and a lot of time. And, and I tell folks that uh, I think Desiree wrote in, in the uh, sidebar where we should form another coalition where we can mobilize each other. You know, the word collaboration keeps coming up. And it's a situation where I, I, I don't know why we can't do that. You know, with the rest, restaurant, Black Restaurant Association, we tried it. And I guess it's just a survival situation. Uh, like with myself, I lost a lot of family and friends to COVID. So the last year and a half, uh, I've been dealing with uh, tragedy in my family. I just got back from New Orleans recently with my father. And the, the business, I was in a bad car accident. I had back surgery. So I was off the grid for a while and trying to keep the business going. So I had a lot of moving parts going on, but in terms of the circle back to your question in regards to what I would have said to myself back in 1988, when it was just manual candies for, for the stores, I would have sought out people in that industry to sit at their feet to get the knowledge that I needed to get without paying for it the way that we have. Thank you so much. Okay, Kevin Blood. So I don't know if you were hard headed when you were younger, but what would you have? What's it, what advice would you have gone to, gone to given to your younger self? <clears throat> I was always hard headed, so that's that's why I had to go in the restaurant business because my granny told me I was too much of a, a a you know what to work for anybody. Uh, to piggyback off, like I said, we think we know everything, and what Norwood said, you know, learning the business of it, and like uh, Kim said, you know, who are we to think we can go in the restaurant business? You know. Uh, Learning just more in depth of learning the business of the business. That's what I would tell anybody. Learn the business of, a, of the business and uh, collab, whether that's, you know, like you said, a mentor or restaurant groups and, and all that. And, and just learn how to play the game in the long run. Because nobody took on this job to work in a kitchen to you 75 years old. I mean, you know. Look at Greg chilling in Florida right now. And that's what I'm talking about. You did this to have like, you know, for your family name, to have security for your family, but your family needs you around too. And that kitchen will kill you. So anybody young going into this, you know, everybody on this panel would tell them it's not easy. You know, you meet so many people and I bet you everybody on there can tell you a lot of people, oh, I want to uh, get to where you are. And don't understand 10 years with three off days in 10 years and and uh, working 150 hour work week and somebody saying, damn, yo, that's just part time. You know what I mean? Chasing your dream and all that. So I would tell anybody that and I would do a lot of things different. But then again, like, you know, I just think everything is your journey too. you know, everything is your journey. Everything. If, if you're teachable, you learn from it and keep it moving. If you're not teachable then more than likely you're not going to make it. You know, you're going to bump your head. You cannot have an ego in the food business. And I tell people that all the time. You can have an ego on a great product, but you can't have ego if some OGs like, you know, a Mr. Johnson or Miss Jennings or somebody from the Doolin's got something to say to you. I mean, I'm like I said, I'm, I'm old school. Compton boy, I remember Jacob Soul Food. I remember Murray's, and you know what I mean. I remember uh, Gadberry's Barbecue and all that. My father used to all those spots. In fact, I got a, co a documentary coming out real soon about the uh, L.A. Uh, soul Food and Barbecue uh, scene and jazz scene in the '70s. That's just going to be incredible because we don't get our props. Uh, especially in barbecue, we don't get our props. And like I tell people all the time, man, when I was a kid, we had more barbecue places on Central Avenue than most states had. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, and we had more soul food spots. So, you know, Doolin's and places like that, they are survivors in this game. I mean, the Watts Coffee House is legendary. I mean, I'm out here in Texas and they talk about her. You know what I'm saying? So I'm proud of all y'all. 
Uh, we never forget our history. Everybody that spoke tonight spoke of something, another older restaurant in LA that we all learned from and, and all that. Know your history, learn your history and respect your history and, and, and always give back, always give back. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna go to Brad Johnson. What, what, what advice would you like to give tonight? What, what's, a, what's a good word from you? David, so first, I don't know if anybody has seen the news about Eduardo Jordan, the talented James Beard chef out of Seattle, losing his businesses and has been accused of some sexual misconduct. And the first thing I would, you know, like to say is, you know, to the panel, I mean, we're all a little bit older, but Bledsoe, Norwood, Greg, you know, we've been around, we know better, but the world has changed. Keep your hands to yourself. Tell your people to keep their hands to themselves. I hate that this brother's career has been derailed. I don't know what's going to happen with him, but it's very sad to see what has happened so far. Um, you know, and Greg, thank you for that uh, that acknowledgement, man. Believe me, that means a lot to me, brother. What you had to say about mentor and, and your pops, you know what he meant to me. So I would I would say to myself many years ago, Adrian, if I could, to marry my wife, you know, much younger and establish some real financial discipline. She's a CPA and a former auditor. And I would have saved a lot of money. I would have made smarter deals and I would have bought more real estate instead of renovating other people's buildings. All right, thank you for that. Okay, Greg and uh, Kim, what about you? What's the good word? Oh, wow. I would tell myself um, to keep praying. Um, always stay on my knees. Exactly what I um, and it, it, it takes a lot of faith to get up and, and do what, I, what we do every day. But the kitchen is my happy place, as a matter of fact. And, and I hate being torn away from it. Uh, I, you know, while I got strength and, and vitality, the ability to get up and do, and be able-bodied to do it, uh, uh, I would remind myself to take care of the body that I'm in. Uh, my, my mental wellness, I think, is something that's really, really important for anybody who's in the restaurant business is ownership, uh, management, and um, also those who are crafting in the kitchens. That's really important to take care of yourself. And um, I would remind myself to, you know, there's something about us believing that it takes a lot of money to, to start a business or to get it off the ground. It certainly helps, of course, um, but you have to, I, I, I can speak for me. I had to faith myself into what I'm doing. Um, it, it took, it took receiving the blessing of the family to, to do what I'm doing right now. Uh, but to, to leave the nest and, and come West was something that was very important, but I had the blessing from the family and, and it was the wind and, and the wind under the wings that, that got me here. Uh, and knowing that they were not and applauding, that really means a lot to me just coming from, the Prince family and doing Nashville hot chicken, but it, it the, the pandemic, three months of open, being open and then having to potentially, you know, almost shuttering our, our doors because of COVID-19 and the, the restrictions on dining rooms and having to close our dining room. But, you know, we're, we're resilient, we, uh, we're resourceful. Uh, Highville Chicken had to just hunker down and go back in the pop-up mode. Um, and then that's how we've been able to stay afloat. Our dining room just opened up last week. And so as I reflect, I had to remind myself to keep faith, keep praying, take care of myself, get up and do it again the next day. That's what I have to tell myself. How about you, Greg? Uh, I'm going to name uh, four restaurants that, that are famous uh, in their own cities and, and nationally. And they all have one thing in common. The Florida Avenue Grill, soul food restaurant in Washington, D.C. Ben's Chili Bowl, also in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. Sylvia's Soul Food Restaurant in Harlem, New York. And Gates Barbecue in Kansas City. And the one thing that all of these restaurants have in common is that they have been able to survive and thrive uh, through the pandemic. Uh, and gentrification uh, specifically. Mm -hmm. And the reason why they were able to do that is because they all own their own real estate. They all own their own restaurant properties and they own their own real estate. 
And in, in the case of Gates, they've expanded beyond their restaurant properties. And so uh, I had the opportunity to buy a whole, whole corner on Crenshaw and 48th Street. Uh, didn't do it. Uh, I could have I could have bought a church. Church didn't do it. Uh, I could have bought more real estate. And uh, fortunately, I own the building where I operate now, and I've owned it for almost thirty years. And that has been the saving grace. That has been what has sustained me. Uh, I, I haven't had to worry about out a landlord uh, raising my rent or somebody or them selling the business to the building to somebody else who raises the rent and who you know uh, forces me out of business and uh, you know in, in the in the time I bought the building it wasn't the nicest neighborhoods but now the Crenshaw district is the fastest growing uh, area in the city of Los, Los Angeles. Uh, we had so, so many missed opportunities. Uh, we own Soul Food Kitchen uh, located on the corner of Manchester and La Brea. And, and we had the opportunity to buy that corner for cheap. Yeah. And we didn't do it. And they, they announced that they're putting a football stadium right down the block. And the real estate went boom. And all of these, you know, Inglewood, you wouldn't recognize it today. And you won't know it five or 10 years from now. But that is the key to our longevity. And I had. A conversation with Miss Ali, the owner of Ben's Chili Bowl, uh, when I was at uh, Howard's Homecoming a uh, uh, year before last. And she said to me, uh, You know, uh, Mr. Doolin, we, we would not be here if we didn't own our property. Uh, they also own Ben's next door, which their upscale restaurant. We wouldn't be here if we didn't own our property. And you know, as as restaurant owners, I think that's how we we have to we have to think. We're in the restaurant business, but we should also be thinking about real estate acquisition at the same same time. Uh, I was so so happy uh, to hear. That one of the the local caterers in uh, in in the city, who has been renting a place on Crenshaw Boulevard, uh, recently left that kitchen because the kitchen came available, and I and I asked where did they go, and I was told that they bought a building somewhere else and re relocated their catering company from this place that they rented to this place that we bought. And you know uh, that's the that's the game changer. That is how we survive long term. That is how we withstand the onslaught of all all of these economic uh, pressures that are coming uh, in our in our uh, coming towards us. And so that's what I would have done more. I would have bought more real estate. All right, thanks. I just want to thank all of the panelists for being a part of this. So I want to thank Kevin Bloodsoe, uh, Kim Prince, Greg Doolin. Brad Johnson, Norwood Clark, and Desiree Edwards. Thank you so much for spending some time for this. Oh, and I think Gail is going to, Gail, are you with us? Can you, can you thank word? you. I am. I just want to yeah. say thank you to everyone. To my younger self, I just said, keep pushing. You're a little bit ahead of yourself. But, you know, uh, people are catching up. This is a Wakanda moment. The bill has been signed. Let's celebrate Juneteenth in a big way this weekend. And thank you all. And certainly go out and get your soul food because that's, you know, at the heart of this Juneteenth celebration. So we have plenty of people to support here and, and also supporting those that are coming up. 
Adrian, I want to thank you. And also to Greg Johnson, thank you immensely for holding us uh, together this afternoon. All right. Well, you stole my thunder. I was trying to think of what I was going to do to close this out, but I think that was a good word. So thank you, everybody. Happy Juneteenth. Blessings to you. And I'll turn it. Um, and thank you, Greg Johnson, again, for all of your moderation and behind the scenes magic. Thank you. Have a good night. <laughs>